Thank you, everyone. Welcome to my talk. Uh, we will be talking about roving on the moon and Mars. So I am Dr. Jaira Sierra Sastre. And I joined NASA Glenn last year uh, to manage space-like projects. So I am going to share some of my experience at NASA Glenn and specifically with the two projects I, I, I am managing at this time. And um, roving on the moon and Mars, when we think about you know, rovers and sending uh, robotic missions to the moon and Mars and, me and beyond, right? We are talking about um, how we are going to support a sustainable presence on these planetary bodies. NASA is, is getting ready um, to go back to the moon, to return to the moon. Um, and then after that, we will learn how to live on a planetary, on, a, on another celestial body. And that will prepare our way and path to, to go to, to Mars someday. So this is me at, at the SLOPE lab, uh, the Simulated Lunar Operations Laboratory at NASA Glenn. Um, as you can see behind me is an engineering model of the Viper rover, and we will learn everything about that. Um, and needless to say, I am truly living my dream, my childhood dream of working for NASA, of contributing to the space exploration sector, and when I think about, about it, it, it really blows my mind um, that as a kid, I, I, I never imagined that someday um, it would be part of my job to be involved in sending these robotic rovers to places, different places in our solar system. And, you know, with, with, the, with the goal in mind of making discoveries and learning more about our universe and answering different types of science questions and enabling this future human exploration um, in these places far away from Earth. So my path to NASA, before we get into, into these exciting uh, missions, um, my path to NASA has been exciting as well. It has been an exciting and, and unique journey. Um, as I mentioned, I joined NASA Glenn back in 2020, in April of 2020. Um, prior to that, I worked as a researcher and an educator in different types of industries. But needless to say, my career as a scientist has been filled with many wonderful adventures. So this is a collage of images summarizing what has been my career as a scientist. So to the left, you see me uh, working a bunny suit, um, working in a nano fabrication facility, studying nanomaterials, uh, materials at the nanoscale, materials that are too small to see. Um, and also you see myself uh, wearing some, some spacesuits, some simulated spacesuits um, that are being designed by industry and to be used um, in, in future space-like missions as well. And also you see me sort of like in a chef's type of role. And that's me learning how to cook space food. And that was part of a very awesome uh, Mars analog mission, a simulation I was part of that I will tell you a little bit about it as well. Um, so new foods for future missions to Mars. So basically I have been, I have the, I have had the opportunity and, and the also opportunity of just contributing to different areas of science and engineering. And now with, you know, my involvement with uh, rover missions, um, yeah, that, that, that for, for, for the most part, you know, it, it, it's, it has been one of the coolest jobs I have had uh, so far. And um, so those experiences prior to NASA, um, as I mentioned, I had this opportunity to leave with five crew members on a volcano, on Manalo Volcano in Hawaii for four months. So I was living in that white geodesic, geodesic dome on the slopes of Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii, simulating what the life and work of astronauts will be like in future missions to planet Mars. And here in the background, you see uh, Mauna Kea volcano. This is um, it, and one of the volcanoes in the big island of Hawaii. On top of those volcanoes are um, telescope, telescopes that are used to do astronomy. And um, 
and yes, I mean, that was one of my first experiences working with NASA projects. This was a NASA funded mission. And what an awesome opportunity as well as a scientist. It was basically my opportunity to live my childhood dream to of, of being an astronaut or sort of an astronaut, right? Uh, without escaping Earth. Um, and this is very important. These type of analog missions are very important because it allow it, they allowed uh, um, scientists to test technologies and study what will be needed to send to send humans to the red planet uh, someday. And humanity has been dreaming about living in other world, worlds for a very long time. Um, and NASA is is preparing. Is preparing to return humans to the moon through the Artemis missions. And um, these missions will make use of mobility systems. I mean, we need ways of transporting astronauts across the surface of the moon and, 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 and in the future on Mars. And we will need mobility systems such as the one that I am showing here, a lunar roving vehicle and other robotic companions that will help astronauts explore the surface of our natural satellite. And a sustained human presence on the moon uh, will also require mobility systems for the utilization of local resources. This is what um, NASA calls in situ resource utilization, uh, such as you know, the use of Martian soil or lunar soil, perhaps to build habitats or doing mining activities or surface excavation activities on the moon uh, to extract resources that could be used, right? Let's say to make a rocket fuel, for example. And lots of mobility systems and uses, um, including transportation of astronauts, as I mentioned, across the surface. So we are seeing now a future that will require lots of mobility systems. And NASA has defined a path to make exploration of, of these celestial bodies a reality. And this is the Artemis program. And very briefly, Artemis um, is the series of missions that NASA is planning to return humans to the moon. Um, they, these missions will pave the way for future explorations on the red planet. And NASA is collaborating with industry to first send to the moon a series of scientific and cargo payloads um, and, and very soon, NASA will also be sending um, the Viper, Viper rover. Um, this is the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. And it's a rover that will hunt for water resources and water ice at the moon sample. And I will show you a very exciting, um, very exciting video here. So the Viper project or Viper rover through NASA's commercial lunar payload services program will take a ride in the SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket for delivery to the moon South Pole uh, by the Astrobotics Briefing lander. So it will be transferred to the moon or transported to the moon by a lander. This rover will roll off the lander to start a one year long mission to traverse as far as you know, 12, 50 miles and we'll use a headlight to venture on permanently uh, shadowed regions on the moon. Uh, the rover will carry science instruments and, and will determine, and it will drill the soil, um, the surface of the moon, to determine the concentration and location of water ice at this location. And this water that could be harvested, I mean, could be harvested by astronauts in future missions to the moon. And this is part of the reason why we are sending this rover, not just to learn more about the science um, of, of lunar science and you know, learn more about our natural satellite, but we want to better understand that region of the moon um, at this lunar south pole to, to inform these Artemis missions, to inform you know, uh, potentially and, and landing locations uh, for these future Ar Artemis missions. So I hope you like that video right there. And um, the landing site, uh, the landing site has been selected uh, recently and is the Nobile region. 
um, in the lunar south pole. Uh, this is a, a region of scientific interest. It's a region um, that is a good match for the capabilities that this rover has to traverse the lunar terrain. Um, but this is an area of very, of, very um, of a lot of scientific um, uh, interest. And the reason for that is that even though we have never been at the South Pole, we have never sent robotic missions to the South Pole, um, NASA and, and the scientific community has conducted a, a prior you know, research um, using um, remote sensing and remote um, uh, equipment. And um, this area is, is filled or is almost permanently covered um, in shadows. And we refer to these areas as uh, permanent, per permanently shadowed regions or PSRs. And these regions are, are of scientific importance based on what we know about these regions. Uh, these regions allow eyes to exist there in those regions. So we are going to hunt for uh, water eyes as part of the Viper mission. And these are some of our Viper engineers. And uh, to tell you a little bit about who they are, these are roboticists and aerospace engineers from three NASA centers, NASA Glenn, NASA JSC, Johnson Space Center, and NASA Ames in California. And I need to say that these are resilient engineers as well. Um, we have overcome many challenges um, over the past few years because of the pandemic. Um, it has been challenging at times to work you know, remotely and plan these tests remotely, but we are you know, finally back you know, at, at the center and conducting a lot of testing, conducting a lot of testing. And this is this is an image of you know the, our simulated uh, lunar operations laboratory at at NASA Glenn, and what you see there is the engineers in action. So this is a, this is a lab that simulates the lunar terrain, a lab that is being used um, to mimic the lunar terrain, and um, and, and it's used by engineers to evaluate rover traction performance. Um, the ability of a rover uh, vehicle to climb slopes and obstacles such as rocks. And as you see here, this rover in action, uh, climbing and descending slopes. Um, and this is, this is a rover performance and that we, we evaluate in this lab. Um, and very recently at the Slope Lab at NASA Glenn, we installed a series of uh, tracking, camera system, uh, tracking camera system or motion tracking camera systems that allowed engineers to precisely measure in real time um, the movement of this rover and compare it to existing computer models so that we determine if the rover is performing as, as, as expected, as the engineers expect the rover to perform. So um, we are, as I was mentioning, that we are also testing wheels, designing wheels for different types of missions, and we will get into that um, in a second. Um, and th this, this is very important because the wheels is one of the key components, right, of these rovers, and it helps the rover traverse uh, different types of, of terrain. And this takes us from the moon to Mars. So I talk and, and describe to you the Viper mission, that is a lunar mission. But another project I, I am part of um, is the Mars Sample Return um, Campaign and the Mars Spring Tire Project. And now we are, you know, let's, let's shift gears a little bit, right? From the moon to planet Mars. And several of you I, I, I are aware, right, of the successful landing of the rover Perseverance, the Perseverance rover. This is a beautiful rover, um, beautiful pictures of, of the landing that were taken during landing of that, of that rover uh, in, in February. And we are still celebrating. I mean, this these successful landing um, of rover, uh, the Perseverance rover on Jezero Crater um, on Mars. 
And um, Crater, Jezero Crater, um, it's, it's a region of scientific interest as well, scientific importance, in, because scientists believe there was a lake um, in, that, in that area of Jezero. And where there was water, there was also the potential for life. So we are interested in asking the fundamental question about whether or not life uh, was present and can thrive outside Earth uh, in other places of our solar system. So for the next few years, Perseverance, that rover, will be collecting soil samples, rock samples. And here you see a picture of Percy, as we call it, uh, uh, Perseverance rover, and Ginny, uh, <laughs> Ginny, the Mars helicopter, the Ingenuity uh, helicopter. And um, this is the first time humanity flies on another world. Um, and Ingenuity has already conducted, completed 16, fly, 16 flights. And Perseverance sits at that area of Jezero Crater. Um, and it's, it's an area of... Uh, scientific uh, importance uh, because, as, as I mentioned, and to, to, to recap, uh, scientists believe that there was a lake there, and if there was water, maybe there was life over there. So we are trying to answer that uh, scientific question. And the first mission, um, the, the, the first mission of this Mars sample return campaign um, it's, it's the mission that is currently be con being conducted by this Perseverance rover. And Perseverance, what Perseverance will do over the next uh, year or so is to collect uh, Martian samples, um, rock samples that a future mission will return or will bring to Earth for further analysis. And NASA Glenn is also part of these of this Mars sample return missions. Um, we are collaborating with the European Space Agency uh, to return those samples or bring those Martian samples back to Earth. And our team at NASA Glenn is um, it's, it's, it's part of the sample retrieval lander mission or the, these uh, series of missions that um, are in charge or responsible for, for bringing those samples to Earth. And let me show you... Um, a sketch or schematic of, of the Mars sample return campaign. So as you can see there, uh, we have Mars 2020 of Mars uh, Perseverance, um, Perseverance rover that has already landed, is in the process of collecting uh, rock samples, placing those rocks uh, and Martian samples inside tubes, that then another um, rover will go and cache, the, the sample fetch rover. So there will be a sample retrieval lander mission that will carry a lander well, with this rover. Um, then, you know, after landing on Mars, this rover will go and pick up those samples uh, that Perseverance will be depositing and living in very specific locations called depots. And then that sample fetch rover, the, basically the, the, the goal or the objective of this sample fetch Petrover is to bring those samples to a rocket that for the first time will be, um, will be landing from the surface of Mars. So this is, this is an artistic rendering of, of the lander uh, carrying the Petrover um, during landing. And this is a, um, a, a, a video, uh, an artistic rendering as well of that sample fetch rover. So the sample fetch rover is currently being designed by the European Space Agency. And what we, what we do at NASA GRC, so we are, we are part of that team because we are designing and building the Chick Memory Alloy Spring Tires that will help this rover traverse the Martian terrain. And as you see, I mean, these are flexible. Um, another way of calling flexible tires is compliant wheels, compliant tires. So very different, right, from, from the current wheels that Perseverance has and other um, Martian rovers have. Um, now we are looking at technologies of flexible tires um, instead of like using rigid, rigid wheels. Um, 
because flexible tires, you know, it, it, it's a better technology to traverse more challenging terrain. Um, so we are we are working on that, uh, designing those wheels, designing those tires for the sample fetch rover. And once again, the found the fetch rover will bring those samples to a rocket um, to the lander, and then for the very first time, um, a rocket will launch uh, from the surface of Mars, and then will bring those rocket those samples to the to the Martian orbit, where there will be a transfer transfer from one spacecraft to another spacecraft uh, because then we need to find a way to then uh, bring those samples back to Earth. Uh, so there will be a, a, a sample return orbiter. There will be a spacecraft responsible for uh, bringing those samples back to Earth. And this is the sample fetch, uh, the, the sample fetch rover, uh, as, as, as I explained. And um, to give you a little bit of, of detail about, you know, why, why we are interested in, in flexible tires while we are adopting this technology and developing this technology for this future rover mission. Um, in the past, uh, during the Curiosity rover mission, um, you may have heard that the, the Curiosity wheels suffer extensive damage uh, caused by uh, some some rocks that are embedded on the surface of of, of 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 Mars, and that pretty much you know cause you know extensive damage and broke those wheels and created um, some holes that were very concerning because that could have compromised the mission. So tire engineers um, have been developing solutions for that. Um, they recognize the need uh, to mitigate that, ri that risk for future missions um, because it's very risky to damage the wheels um, of a rover. And that's how in, at, at NASA GRC, um, tire engineers over the years, they have been working on recreating or um, uh, reverse engineering the the, the flexible tires that were used during the Apollo missions. And a lot of lessons were learned um, throughout the years. And eventually the Mars spring tire uh, was born. And our engineers at NASA Glenn um, have designed a tire, a flexible tire made of springs that um, have the ability to deform, to conform to rocky terrain and reversibly deform. They are using materials such as shape memory alloys. So these are tires that are durable. These are tires that have the ability to conform to rocky terrain, uh, to, to absorb the impact um, uh, energy um, of, the, of that impact of, of a vehicle uh, when it traverses you know, different types of obstacles on the surface. Um, and we are working on that, and we are testing those uh, flexible tires right now, uh, doing live testing, uh, meaning you know, uh, basically studying, evaluating wheel performance um, over simulated Martian terrain, um, looking at how you know the levels of stiffness um, that that these tires will will require um, to perform well. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So very very exciting work happening, and I am I feel very very honored to be part of um, the team uh, responsible for the design, the build, and delivery of these stars to the European Space Agency uh, uh, rover or it's, uh, European Space Agency and and the teams responsible over there for for designing the sample fetch rover. So these are some of the members of my team. Um, in action, uh, and these are these are some of the early uh, design iterations of, of those flexible tires. And everything we do at NASA, um, uh, everything we do for research, for technology development, um, it's to expand our understanding of of you know of of our of our universe. But we are also interested on research and technology for the benefit of all. So we are always looking at ways of bringing those space technologies um, 
and, and finding applications of those space technologies uh, to, to find solutions to problems here back on Earth. So there are several applications um, for these type of like shape memory alloys and shape memory alloy springs that are we are using uh, to create these tires. So there are many other applications um, for, for these springs, such as, you know, in the medical um, sector, um, tiny, tiny shape memory alloy springs um, and materials could be used for, for, for medical devices, such as steams. Um, aerospace applications, automotive applications, uh, civil st uh, structures or um, structures that will withstand um, earthquakes, perhaps, and even textiles. We can think about, you know, what else could be done with these type of materials um, to create similar responsive type of, of garments. So lots of lots of things um, and lots of lots of exciting, exciting research. And um, the end goal, right, uh, for these, you know, roving uh, uh, on Mars and the moon and um, our, our dreams about uh, potentially, you know, visiting and staying and living in these other celestial bodies and planetary systems. Sure, let, let, let's, let's dream, you know, to make something like this a reality that we, we will be someday. Um, uh, driving these these vehicles on the surface of Mars, and we are pretty close to see that coming true um, with these future Artemis missions to the Moon. So that's all I have for today, and I will open it for questions. And thank thank you for thank you for your attention. I just wanted to ask, what's the do they have an idea of what the estimated lifespan of these tires is going to be with these rovers lasting so much longer than they're expected to? Is there any idea how long these types of tires might last? That, that's a very interesting question because from an engineering perspective, um, we receive requirements based on the type of mission, the type of vehicle that uh, we need to consider when designing these tires. And for the purpose of the sample fetch rover, um, basically we are, we are talking about kilometer distances, right? That will need to be traversed that the rover will need to traverse to pick up the samples, cache the samples, return them to the lander. So we are developing um, and designing tires that will meet those um, that, that, that life requirement, as we call it, or durability requirement. Um, and the way engineers do it is, you know, we, we test it. We test the tires um, using simulated terrain, as I described, and we tested even for, you know, let's say that the mission asks us to build a tire that will be durable for, to traverse, let's say five kilometers. We will test that like three, four times the life requirement to make sure that the tires will last. Can you talk a little bit about how these rovers are powered and what the developments in battery technology are doing to, to kind of, uh, aid in the service life of these rovers? Yes, so for the Viper mission, um, the battery will be solar powered. Uh, we know that Perseverance rover uses nuclear energy for, for, to generate power. Uh, the sample fetch uh, rover uh, will, will also use uh, solar cells or photovoltaic technology to, to, for, for the power that is needed. Uh, we had another question. Uh, how do you adjust for the uh, lower gravity on the moon and Mars when you're designing the vehicles? How does that affect the, uh, the capabilities of the vehicle? Excellent question. Excellent question. Yes. So that, that's a really important question because systems are not going to behave the same way they behave here on Earth when they are in, in, in different gravity environments. So for the moon, uh, we are talking about one six. Uh, of the gravity of Earth on Mars is, is just one third of the gravity of Earth. So what we do for testing, um, what we do for testing is uh, we use uh, equipment and we basically apply loads that are similar to the loads that these stars will experience um, when they are on, on the moon or Mars. So that's, that's one way of mimicking uh, what will happen 
um, in or you know with with these with these wheels and these systems and these rovers when they are traversing terrain um, under different gravity um, environmental conditions. Can you talk a little about the adjustments needed in the rovers, tires, and systems based on the different soil and ground composition? And how does the NASA team deal with those different terrains? So basically what we do at the Slope Lab, we have uh, different types of simulants or like soil simulants. We have lunar uh, simulants, we have Martian simulants. So engineers and scientists have come up with ways of, of designing soils um, and materials that will simulate those terrains. Um, so that's that's a very important uh, thing to consider because as part of the design, right, um, in order for these wheels to meet their performance requirements, um, these, these wheels will need to traverse different types of terrains. Some of them will be like soft soil. So, and we will need to meet requirements for like what we call like soft soil wind drift uh, uh, traction requirements. So these, these tires will need to be designed in a way to meet uh, the requirements for traversing soft soil terrain uh, while keeping good traction in that soil. And at the same time, uh, meeting requirements and coming up with a design that will allow this tire to traverse um, rocky terrain, for instance. And there are trade, trade offs, uh, trade studies that are, are conducted to see how we can balance um, traction uh, performance or traction properties of these tires with durability, let's say. Uh, so we need, we need to take all those type of like uh, performance requirements and, and tires uh, properties into consideration and conduct trade studies to see what, what the best solution, what, what, what's, what's the best solution uh, to be designed in order to meet these requirements for traversing different types of terrain. You mentioned working with other NASA centers on the project, uh, including uh, like Ames in California. Uh, can you expand on how the cross-center relationships work? Because uh, NASA Langley is in Virginia, but it does work with uh, other areas uh, like aeronautics. Uh, so can you talk about how those relationships kind of work with other NASA centers? That's excellent. Awesome. Uh, so for the most part, uh, um, NASA, uh, the work that we do that NASA, right, we cannot do the work alone. I mean, we, re we need uh, very collaborative um, um, efforts and teams. And what, what we do is, you know, for to give you a, a, a specific example, um, we are working with NASA JPL, NASA JPL, and we collaborate with them. They shared uh, their extensive experience sending and, and landing um, these, these Martian rovers and also their past experience with wheel design. So there is a highly collaborative um, information exchange um, effort to basically learn from those past experiences, learn from past data, apply lessons learned um, during uh, current developments and current design efforts. Um, and we work with NASA JPL um, for the Viper rover. We are work, working with NASA JSC and NASA Ames, and specifically for the mobility test um, work that we are overseeing at NASA GRC, these uh, roboticists and uh, mobility test engineers, they come together, um, they work on test plans together, um, and we are having, I mean, we have the engineers from Ames and JSC come to GRC and work together uh, to make observations and, and gather data, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if, if the question, I mean, it's if, if what the person wants to learn or know, it's, you know, how, how does that work on a daily basis? Yeah, we, we, we meet pretty often, the engineers meet, they plan, they revise plans, they, um, uh, for, for Viper, they, they, I mean, they, they, they meet uh, very frequently uh, to discuss test plans um, and and the set of activities and test uh, different uh, different types of tests that will be performed during test campaigns at NASA Plan. Any idea when we might see some of the uh, like the airless bicycle tires? When we might see some of these applications commercially available? 
Yeah, I don't I don't have a timeline or a, a clear idea of when this will be on the market. Um, but um, yes, these technologies has been has been licensed, and there are some some uh, develop, uh, cooperative agreements as well with industry. And there has been um, uh, parties uh, from from the industry side interested in these technologies that are looking for ways to uh, to collaborate um, and have agreements with NASA um, to to find you know how to design specifically design uh, or use this entire technology for those applications. But hopefully we will see <laughs> we will see spring tires um, in our bicycles and other types of earth bound vehicles in the near future. I, I hope to see that. Okay, uh, so you have had an interesting background in many ways. Can you share how you and NASA Glenn do STEM engagement with students? And could you please share any suggestions you may have for parents or grandparents on how to engage their kids in STEM? Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I like that question. Uh, outreach and STEM engagement is a passion of mine. Um, I, I, I may not have mentioned it, but prior to becoming a scientist, I was a high school teacher. That was my first job. My first passion was uh, science education. And I am glad that I am able to continue nurturing that passion for, for space and STEM education throughout this type of engagements with the public and as part of my job at NASA Glenn, now as a scientist and project manager. So we are um, always um, interested and open uh, for, for invites uh, from the general public and um, educational institutions that may be interested in hearing more about specific different types of topics, uh, NASA related topics uh, from subject matter experts um, that um, can come to your organization and, 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 and share about what they do at NASA and, and share about the different missions NASA is working on right now. Initially, how, how that happens is you, you contact um, our external relations um, department or, or, or people responsible for making those connections. And, and from there, you know, as, as we are seeing today, I mean, we, we, we receive this invitation uh, from, from, uh, from your museum and we are here. We are here sharing with the public excitement of, of the work we do at NASA. And advice to parents and grandparents about how to get their, their, their kids excited um, about STEM uh, in general and, and science and space. Uh, my, my advice would be, um, th there are so many, many opportunities for students to engage in hands-on experiences, engage in projects, uh, NASA projects, um, whether it is through, you know, citizen science uh, projects that NASA supports or uh, robotic competitions um, that students can be part of. My advice would be encourage your children to be part of these projects, to, to give it a try, because it's in the process of doing that we, we discover these passions and um, all, none of us know what research is until we have an experience, a direct experience and hands-on experience with research. And it might be very surprising to many of, 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 of the uh, students that may be uh, listening to us uh, today that, you know, just, just give it a try, participate in a project where you are going to get your hands, you know, you, you, you will be making something um, and you will learn a lot and you may discover that this is a passion of yours. So that will be my piece of advice. We're very happy to have you here for Lunch Break Science. We love having NASA speakers come. We've had some really great uh, feedback from our audience on our, on our NASA presenters. So circling back to the sample return mission, uh, do we have a timeline on when we expect the sample return mission to return the samples to Earth? And uh, do you know what kinds of tests are going to be done on those samples? Yeah, so for the Mars sample return mission, um, and this, that's a really good question, if we have young students um, listening to this talk today, uh, the Mars sample return mission and the, the one that will, you know, send uh, the, the rocket and the sample fetch rover that is expected to happen by the end of this decade. And the mission itself will take um, a few years. I mean, there will, be, there will be some time, one, two years of transit then um, uh, a year or so for surface operations, and then we will need to return them. So we are talking about some time 
in the 2030s, right? And this is very important because right now I am giving this talk about what I am doing right now, but the reality is that is, is that is the students that are listening to us today, the ones that are going to be the scientists and engineers. Um, answering those questions, analyzing the samples, working on labs around the, wor the world to try to find um, signs of ancient life on these on these samples. So what is expected in terms of testing is these will be rock samples that will be available for the scientific community um, and all sorts of, of different types of testing and analysis uh, could be done in, in actual you know, Martian samples from from spectrometry studies to look at mineral composition, um, do more of a, like of a geological type of studies to perhaps you know more molecular type of analysis to see if we we actually find um, uh, signs or or biosignatures uh, that uh, could um, give us an idea of whether or not there was microbial life in in the past of Mars. All right, I don't see anything else popping up in the chat, uh, so we can go ahead and bring it to a close for today. Uh, so thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Dr. Yahira Sierra Sastre, for joining us and helping us discover more about our world. Please join us on Wednesday, December 8th at noon, uh, for the Archaeology of Connections, Chemical Sourcing of Shell Beads. Uh, it's going to be presented by John Henshaw. Uh, he's a PhD student in anthropology at William & Mary. Uh, you can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend. It is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thank you all for being here today. Mm -hmm.